Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. My intent is to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature is in us? I will be featuring authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth helps us create bridges. We'll see what's trending, what's relevant to our world today, not just for land use, but to connect the dots between ourselves and nature. It's time for practical action and profound inner change so our natural world is valued once again. And today, I'm delighted to introduce you to Carol Chia. She is a research entomologist at Valley Laboratory here at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. I met her at a Master Gardener Symposium, and she gave us a talk about the eastern hemlock and the woolly adelgid pest that's devastating um, this particular tree in our forest. Carol, um, I'm glad to uh, welcome you here today. How are you? Hi, I'm great. Good morning, Judith, and good morning to all your listeners. Thank you so much for inviting me to share my research. Yes, I'm delighted here. So let's start with um, the, the hemlock in general. If you could tell us about the tree species and its role in the forest. Yes, um, well, eastern hemlock is a very ancient species. We actually, in North America, have four species native uh, to our continent. And um, eastern hemlock is obviously in the east, sometimes called Canadian hemlock. Uh, The Latin name is Suga canadensis. And eastern hemlock is a very beautiful uh, evergreen. And you probably even have seen it a lot. Uh, Your listeners probably have even, like, wandered in in, um, state parks or forests or trails and been under the shade of this magnificent tree. So eastern hemlock ecologically is a very important species because uh, ecologists view it as a foundation species. And they coined this term because they believe that it's a tree species that so defines the ecosystem that it creates under its mature uh, canopy Uh, that defines community structure so that it affects the kind of other species that live within it. Um, It modulates the the hemlock trees being um, evergreen and long-lived and very shade tolerant can also um, affect the soil properties uh, and many other things such as um, uh, stream temperatures that drain through these um, hemlock forests. So eastern hemlock And in forestry, um, it's not considered a very important commercial species because it hasn't got the characteristics of wood strengths that other species do. But it's a very important ecological species, and that's what I want to convey to your uh, listeners. It's uh, They call it a foundation species of great importance. Therefore, if we lose that species or we have dramatic decline of that species, it's going to affect a ton of different things that comp- uh, that rely on it. So a kind of a ripple effect. You know. Imagine if you remove the species. Well, Carol, give us a couple examples of that ripple effect. Well, um, so for example, there's a lot of wildlife that is dependent on eastern hemlock. Now, eastern hemlock, I'll just preface this by telling you where it likes to grow. So it's an evergreen, huge, um, uh, long-lived evergreen, um, record size, I think, has been over 160 feet. Um, it, it can reach five to 600 years. I think the record age is nearly a 1,000 years. And in Pennsylvania, they call it the redwood of the east. Um, so hemlock um, has a, a number of uh, species that are very strongly associated with it, i.e. they really need the hemlock in order to survive and breed and reproduce. So a number of people have done a lot of studies on this, and there are several bird species that de- definitely are, are strongly dependent on the hemlock. Um, one of the species is um, the, um, the warblers. There's a Blackburnian warbler, beautiful little bird. I've only seen it a couple of times. 
and the black-throated green warbler, which is not threatened because it's very prevalent, but it is strong. Wherever you go in a hemlock forest, apparently, you can hear these warblers singing in the tops of the trees. So obviously, if you lose this tree, you will lose the, these warblers, will lose their habitat, and there's a bunch of other bird species, like the Arcadian flycatcher, which are dependent on the hemlock um, on forest. And then there are also, um, if you go from the other sphere, you know, from the birds, there are also um, rare salamanders um, that depend on the very cold waters that these hemlock trees um, uh, are shade. So for example, I just found out not too long ago that the um, northern spring salamander is a threatened species in Connecticut, um, the Connecticut deep is designated as a threatened species because it needs the very cold waters that only hemlock uh, forests can provide. So this is a threatened species here. Um, then there's also uh, our native brook trout, which at the current moment are not threatened, but they require very clean, very cold waters. And once again, those waters can only be found when fringed by hemlock trees. So you can see that almost... Uh, I would say that hemlocks are almost sort of a sentinel species because they they create the conditions in which streams can and, and headwaters that fill our reservoirs um, are, 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 are pure and clean and cold water. So if you lose those protective cover of the hemlocks, you can see the cascading effect that could happen all the way down um, into our reservoirs even. Well, that also affects all of us because if, because if we lose uh, the salamander, for example, where somebody's losing their food, right? Yes. And, yes. and the, the native trout is still around, but it's certainly yes. a species to watch. And then right. if we lose the, the bird species, we're losing um, a member of that ecosystem that has a role yes. and a place. So, yes. again, looking at a holistic concept, if some part is not working up to par, it's going to affect the entire ecosystem. And yes, what we've been so. con concerned about here in the Northeast is what's happening to our eastern hemlocks. So you have done tremendous research on the woody adelgid pest in particular. Could you tell us more about that? Yes, the hemlock woody adelgid. It's a very interesting pest. I first um, started studying this down in Virginia, and it is uh, by no coincidence <laughs> that this belief that this non-native pest is an exotic pest. We believe it's um, originated from Japan, and I can go into that in a little bit. But um, the adelgid, so it's, it's exotic, it's invasive, and it's not native to our hemlock trees. And Unfortunately, both our native eastern hemlock and the other native hemlock, which is called the Carolina hemlock, which exists in only very small area in the southern Appalachians, in the, top, in the mountainous areas of, um, of the southern Appalachians, are both susceptible to this pest. And so um, the woolly adelgid, we believe, um, may have been accidentally introduced during um, collections of, of exotic conifers, especially from Japan. So this was the thinking before we had the genetic tools, and since then, um, uh, a colleague of mine, Nathan Havel, has done some tremendous research genetically and traced the origin of all the adelgids that we are suffering now on the east, eastern seaboard were from an adelgid that came in from southern Japan. It's, it's pretty amazing. It was suspected before by Dr. Mark McClaw, who was my predecessor here at the Connecticut Ag Station, but it has been confirmed since using all these uh, newly uh, 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 genetic advances. And so everything that we have here on the eastern seaboard, apparently, according to Nathan's research, has come from southern Japan. Hmm. And uh, this this insect, it is, um, it's, I guess to describe to your to your listeners, it's kind of it's related to the aphids, but it's an ancient ancient lineage, and these adelgids are mostly sessile, so they don't move really. There's only one stage that moves really, and it's the crawler stage. So when they initially hatch out from the eggs, 
there are these little specks, they're sort of reddish brown, and they move around, and those are the what we call the crawler stage of the first nymph. And that's the stage that will spread, and when it finds a hemlock stem that it likes, it stops, inserts its feeding, its feeding mouth part, and then it will stay there for the rest of its life. It will go through all its molting, etc., in place on the hemlock stand at that precise spot that it's selected. So it doesn't move after that. And what it now, does in, when it's there, Carol, it eats the, yeah. the needles, correct? No, actually, um, the adelgid is kind of interesting. It doesn't eat the needles. It's not a strict defoliator like a lot of caterpillars and, and other um, insects will actually eat the needles. So what it does is it inserts its feeding mouth part. And it actually drains, sucks out the storage cells within the stem. So it's a very different kind of uh, um, of damage. It's not something that you, you will see holes or anything like that on the needles. It's not like that at all. But by draining the uh, storage parenchyma cells in the hemlock, it deprives the hemlock of the ability to put out new growth. And we all know how important new growth is to our trees because that's the photosynthetic material that's going to capture the energy from the sun uh, in order for the tree to grow. So by hampering the ability of the tree to put out new growth to capture uh, the energy, um, the, ha- the woolly adelgid can quickly overwhelm the tree to the point where it can't put out new growth. It's, uh, studies by Dr. Mark McClaw showed that even low densities will actually restrict the amount of new growth that is put out or even just completely stop it altogether. And so you can see that if populations build up over a tree uh, and if it spreads throughout the tree, pretty much the whole tree will be affected in a matter of one to two years. That's a very short time, isn't it, to lose trees? Yes. Uh, yes. Well, it, the tree, tree death doesn't occur within one or two years. I'm sorry if I okay. gave that impression. It's more that the tree will start to show decline very shortly after uh, when it's affected by the adelgid. And it could take four years sometimes. It can take much longer than that. And I think that's where your whole concept of how we're all interconnected plays in because hemlocks don't just um, respond directly to the pest. There's so many other stresses that are affecting our hemlock trees today whether they're in our garden or in the mountains or in a ravine or around a lake. Um, There's all the climatic stresses that are being compounded even as we speak right now. And then there are other pests that also move in and take advantage of the hemlock tree when it's in a weakened state, when it's stressed. So so the woolly adelge is definitely one of the most serious damaging pests that we've uh, encountered for eastern hemlock. But prior to the arrival of these invasive insects, you know, woolly adelgid is one. There's another very serious uh, exotic pest called the elongate hemlock scale. But prior to that, you know, our hemlocks also did suffer uh, a lot of stress and mortality. But it came from um, abiotic factors such as drought, extended Mm -hmm. drought, especially during the summer, obviously, when the tree is growing. And there's also another insect that opportunistically um, attacks the hemlock trees when they are weak, and it's called the hemlock borer. And that is a native insect, but it has adapted to strike when hemlock trees are weakened by drought. So those were the two major uh, elements. There's also another defoliator. Now, that's a needle defoliator called a hemlock looper. That's also native, and that would periodically come through and defoliate um, our hemlock trees too. But you can see that the hemlocks that managed to survive in spite of all these native stresses, but now we have these two exotic species that they don't, and you put that on top of all the other stresses, and you have a situation where our hemlock trees are being threatened now. Well, it's true, and we know that if this is a a tree that survives near water or needs water and also uh, has a hard time with severe drought, then yes. th- th- when that becomes weakened, as you said right from the beginning, there's this whole chain reaction. It's not just the tree yeah. that's weakened. It's everything down 
the the pike that it supports that it uh, is a part of its its community completely suffers, and mm-hmm. that's that's the kind of concept or dot I'm trying to connect with these um, podcasts is that what we do affects everything. And we don't live in isolation, and nature doesn't live in isolation. And you bring that out so beautifully in in your talks about how important the tree is and, you know, what it affects. Is there anything else uh, um, that you want to um, highlight here? Yeah, um, Judith, you know, I I mentioned the birds, and I mentioned, obviously, the, the amphibians, the fish. And, of course, I forgot to mention even... There's so many diverse mammal species that really depend on our uh, hemlocks as well. And I know that, you know, white-tailed deer aren't <laughs> exactly our favorites as gardeners, but in the northern New England areas, white-tailed deer really depend. There's been studies that have shown that they really depend on the cover of hemlock stands for winter protection and for winter survival, which is pretty amazing. And we have the black bear, um we have a whole list of mammals that uh, folks from the U.S. Forest Service and from wildlife um, uh, places have documented. There's a northern flying squirrel that's strongly associated with um, um, eastern hemlock. I mean, let me think of others. Um, a ton of, of different species, that mammal species, that also require the hemlock habitat. So you can see it's not just... The birds, it's everything, as you say. And and the, the one amazing thing about hemlocks that I've learned all these years of studying them is that um, hemlocks are able to endure very long periods of uh, shade by just not growing. They call it, uh, foresters know this very well, they call it um, a suppression. So you could have a very small hemlock tree, and I'm talking really small, a tiny little tree, maybe about three inches in diameter. And that tree could be a 100 years old. Isn't that fascinating, Judith? Oh, that's amazing. You know, one of yes. the one of the first um, tree talks I went to through the Master Gardener program, I we always think of the rings of a tree tell us the age. Yeah. And so right. you see something that's four feet in diameter, you go, oh, my God, that's got to be, you know, 200 <laughs> years old. But that's not right. necessarily true in the forest. Uh, they showed us right. the species of trees that were very small in diameter. I'm talking like two to three inches. And they were far older than something that was at least one to two feet in diameter, which I find fascinating how the forest works. Yeah, Yeah. I think it's amazing. And and furthermore, so the forest is always telling you, don't assume the age of the tree by looking at the diameter. It's something I've learned by, by walking around with foresters who know their trees. They know their forests. And the amazing thing is, so so you have a, a small tree, perhaps, in the understory of a forest, mm-hmm. of a hemlock forest. You've got a giant there, and then you've got the small tree. And those trees could be actually kind of closer in age than you would imagine, but the fact is that the larger tree has shaded that little tree. And so it endures under those conditions, but it just doesn't put on any growth every every year. And then say that large tree gets toppled by a tornado or something, or a woolly adelgid hits it or something, and it dies, and, and that, or it breaks off, and suddenly you have all the sunlight pouring in on that little tree. That little tree, as the foresters tell me, is, is then released. They call it released. And that tree will just suddenly activate itself and respond to all those uh, uh, better growing conditions and shoot up which to me is amazing that it could just kind of stay dormant for so long. And then when the right opportunity occurs, it can spring up and take its place in the canopy in the wake of perhaps the death or or the breakage of the larger tree that was overshadowing it. Well, you know, what's interesting about that whole um, explanation is that I feel and others feel that there's a real intelligence in nature. And Again, if we look at ourselves as a species, we seem to want everything quickly, here, now, uh, last week, blah, blah, blah. But yet when we look at the ancient spiritual teachings for ourselves as a species, 
it's it's the patience of going with the flow it's a patience of observing nature it's the patience of being in the stillness with nature to watch nature and nature will teach us so uh, to me that's a principle of you know staying quiet and dormant for however long it takes until the right timing and the right conditions occur that's a great teaching right. from the forest Yes, yes, and the hemlocks can teach us so much, you know. They I mean, can. one of the beauties of, of, of my work is that I get to go out in the forest a lot because a lot of my research uh, I've learned over the years that you can't just do everything in the lab. You have to have a combination and not just a field experiment like on a farm or something. You have to go out into the woods be out there and see what's happening out there. And many times uh, ideas that I'll have to follow up on research come from being out there because you're out there, you see the real condition, you see the real stresses that uh, the trees uh, uh, are subject to in different environments because hemlocks grow over a wide range of varieties. Yes, they do like moist conditions, they like cool, that's their optimal. But you can find hemlocks on, on, on dry, rocky ridges and you sometimes wonder how the heck <laughs> they survive right. up there, and and what they do is, uh, I, I truly believe this is is be they find crevices and cracks in the rocks, and they send there. And although it is typically characterized as a shallow rooted tree, obviously in those on oh, those cliff edges, etc., they're finding cracks, and they send their roots deep down, and the roots are kept cool by the rocks, and obviously moisture collects within the rocks from rainwater and whatever groundwater. And that's how they're able to survive. So they not only can survive in what we call typical cool, moist ravines, that's where they do the best, but they'll find a niche wherever that seed lands, and they will they will try to hang on. But then you you throw in something like the hemlock woolly adelgid, you throw in an extended drought, just as what we've just gone through in Connecticut for for two two or more years. And now the tree that was able to kind of cling <laughs> to that rather hostile environment is now under so much stress that it, 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 it is overwhelmed. Yes, and so today, what are the implications? And you did mention, um, if you could uh, sort of summarize for us, your research with the weather and how the very cold conditions uh, seem to keep this pest in check. Yes, yes, I will uh, summarize that. That's been a culmination of, of more than 15 years of research. And I'll tell you how it first began. It was um, so here at the station, we were investigating the potential of a little tiny lady beetle that feeds specifically on hemlock woolly adelgid that was brought that we brought over from Japan, from southern Japan, which turns out is the exact origin of the eastern hemlock uh, uh, of the woolly adelgid that plagues our eastern hemlocks. So in order to rear our little beetle, we actually have to find adelgid because that's the only way that we can rear it. We have to rear it on the pest itself. It was the year 2000. It was the January of 2000, and we relied heavily on this, uh, on being able to go out in the forest. And at that time, hemlock woolly adelgid was prevalent throughout the whole the whole state. It was probably one of the peaks of our infestation. You know, the adelgid was actually discovered in Connecticut or reported to the station in 1985. So that was the first time we knew that it was here. Um, but, you know, in, in less than 15 years, it was all over the state. So backtrack to 2000, it was cold, uh, but it wasn't abnormally cold. And then we had this sudden cold drop in temperatures that affected the northern half of the state. In fact, even the northern two-thirds of the state. And what happens when we went out into the forest to collect food to rear our beetles, we discovered that all the intelligence were dead. Hmm. It was quite an eye-opener. Uh, but it also meant we were thrown into a panic. We had we had no living adelgid to feed our, our beetles. It was the middle of winter, so we panicked and we and we. I just said to a, a inspector friend of mine, um, you know, let's go south. There are very few hemlocks along the coast, but maybe we'll find something. <laughs> maybe it's a little milder there. Maybe they won't all be dead. And that's actually what we found. We found that. Along the coast, in coastal pockets where hemlock still thrived, um, the adelgid mortality was only about 20%, whereas it was more than 80% over the whole northern uh, two-thirds of the state. So that dawned on me that 
you know, this 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 uh, winter effects on the Delgit. And the reason, Judas, that I forgot to mention earlier is is hemlock woolly Delgit is so unusual because it actually feeds during the winter. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many insects do you know feed during the winter? Mostly they go dormant. That's mm-hmm. how they're able to survive. Mm-hmm. Hemlock woolly Delgit has a generation that actually feeds during warmer times of the winter. So in Japan, they're feeding throughout the winter probably because it's very mild there and so the adelgid was feeding and then this sudden cold abrupt uh, um, uh, um, now we we know no it was a polar vortex outbreak from the arctic circle actually killed the adelgid so that started me looking at at this whole how the interplay of our winters affects Hemlock woolly adelgid. Now, obviously, this is going to be more important up here in the northeast because we are much closer <laughs> uh, 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 to the cold outbreaks. But you know, occasionally that cold outbreak can extend all the way down even into Virginia and North Carolina. But mm-hmm. obviously, they don't have it that often. So mm-hmm. the adelgid populations I found are, are highly susceptible to these what we call now the polar vortex outbreaks, and we've had. Amazingly enough, four of these events in the last five years, and we've never had them so frequent and so regularly. And this has drawn my attention to it. We had one in 2014, 2015 was an extended, very cold winter with lots of snow. And then 2016 was really the one that proved it all. We, if everybody recalls, it was a very mild winter, and then suddenly on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2016, we had this sudden cold outbreak, and it only lasted a few hours. But I live in in the northern part of Connecticut. It went down to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, which is really cold, and I've not seen that in the years I've lived in Connecticut. Um, And it was minus 22 in in the central part of Connecticut, and it it devastated Adelgid all through the state, even down at the shore. So do you see any kind of uh, positive uh, response amongst the hemlock trees because of this? Uh, are you seeing our hemlock trees uh, not being stressed out um, as much as they were perhaps 15 years ago? Well, yeah. Interestingly enough, so right on the heels of that, 2016, we had that, that cold kill, which was, it killed a lot of uh, adelgids off throughout the state. The highest I've ever monitored for uh, mortality statewide was 98%. But it did not kill as heavily the elongate hemlock scale, which is another pest that co-occurs, because that pest is dormant during the winter. So the elongate hemlock scale was affected a little bit, but it didn't really affect it uh, tremendously like it did the Delgid. So that pest remains. So there's a problem that continues. And then we had this drought. So Judas is like, unfortunately, it didn't time altogether. So the drought came in, and because hemlocks are shallow-rooted, and the drought was so extensive, you know, it was 11 months in the north region. It was actually over 22 months along the shore. It affected hemlock trees. So the hemlocks that looked so great after the intelligent was killed off, they uh, suddenly had drought stress. Mm-hmm. But there's hope. There's hope. So in 2017, when I when I so when I documented their health in uh, and I look I go out there and I measure all kinds of tree health parameters. Um, uh, uh, so I was very disappointed. 2016, the trees looked awful. They lost a lot of needles, and uh, they looked thin and they looked very stressed so I was quite upset <laughs> and mm. then in 2017 we had rain yes we and did we had a lot of rain mm-hmm. and rain helps hemlocks recover and that's the one thing I want to convey to your listeners many times you'll see in the literature it's all over the hemlocks cannot recover well I'm here to tell you that they can because I've seen it myself in the forest if there's ample rain, and especially we get these summer rains, I know we don't really want devastating floods, etc., but the rains will save our trees because they give the hemlocks a chance to reflush after the adelgid has been wiped out by uh, cold winters. Hmm. So well. we're seeing some sort of refoliation. So you can see how everything's connected. The weather, the climate, is really the climate because... Uh, 
if you look at our temperatures over the winters, and you, I've looked at this from using um, data that's been collected for many, many decades, you can see that actually our our overall winter temperatures have been warming, and you can correlate that with the advance of the adelgid northwards into northern New England and even into Nova Scotia. Hmm. Well, that, that's the part that's hard for us as uh, landowners to really track. We might know it's hotter, we might know it's more of a drought, we might know there's a lot of right. rain, but we don't really understand, uh, because we're not educated about it, how this impacts the quality of our forest. And unfortunately, like you said, we hear this media puts out these sensational headlines, uh, yeah. which may be originally based on some fact, but they put a spin on it, and so we get this wrong impression. So I really right. appreciate all the uh, research that you've done and uh, your summary of the problem and what's going on out there. So, can, you, can Carol, can you give our listeners, you know, maybe three uh, tips that they can take away with today about this uh, particular issue? Sure, sure. I'll try to be very practical. <laughs> I'll tell you what I do. So I live in the northern part, so I'm, I'm blessed with having more uh, cold winters than somebody who lives along the shore. So what I would say is just check your trees. If you've got hemlock trees growing in your landscape at home, or even, you know, obviously when you hike, etc., but you can't do anything about those, check them manually, especially after the winter. If we've had a mild winter, a warm winter, that will be the time to think, all right, I might need to do some intervention here, and I might need to control any incipient um, woolly adelgid and elongate hemlock scale problems you might have. And you can easily do this. You can look, the, because the adelgid grows during, uh, develops and feeds during the winter, their, their woolly mass will be most prominent in late, in late winter, early spring, because they're about to lay eggs. So turn over the tips of your hemlock branches, the, the newest growth, so the, 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 the outermost growth. If you see the white woolly balls along the stem, so they're along the stem, or you see perhaps flecks on the needles, that would be the scales, then you'll know you have a slight problem. Now, if it's just a few tips here and there, and they're fairly low to the ground, you can actually just prune them off. And just take a pruner and tip those, uh, take those, those uh, infested branch tips off. If it's a little bit more than that, you can easily use what we call a, 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 a dormant offspray, a horticultural offspray. And as gardeners, you guys will be familiar with this, or, or even a soap spray, because that what you're doing is you're going to spray the underside and soak the whole branch from the top and the bottom, and that will kill the adelgid also. Uh, and the scale is a double whammy. You get two for one there. So I would say check your hemlocks after winter, especially after a mild winter. When you, when you, when you, if you have a row of hemlocks, uh, a hedge, say, and it's alongside a driveway, when you do your snow blowing, don't throw the snow onto the hemlocks, throw it away from it, because snow is a protective cover and it will actually help, uh, the insect pests survive. So throw your snow away from the hemlocks if you can. Um, and the other thing is, if you have a, if we have a dry spell, and, and I'm talking, you know, not just a, a, a abnormally dry spell of one or two weeks. I'm talking like, you know, if we have a month-long drought, try to water your trees if you can, the base of your hemlocks. And uh, arborists will tell you to, uh, to to mulch the bottom of your, the, mulch the roots of your hemlock. Don't mulch them so deep that you're suffocating them, but give them something akin to what they would have in the forest, all that leaf litter. And that will help cool the cool the roots, and it will help uh, preserve the moisture that's there. And don't fertilize with high nitrogen. Uh, Mark McClaw's work showed that if you use high nitrogen, what you're doing, and you'll know this as a gardener, you're actually exacerbating the pest problem because <laughs> you're actually promoting new growth that the pest will flourish. So using a, an organic low nitrogen uh, mineral type fertilizer and to to boost your tree after you've controlled. Um, with an all spray or something. And probably that's the best I can give you as a for homeowner tips. And oh, also great. there's biological control. I forgot to mention. Biological control is available to the homeowner. So this little lady beetle that I've actually worked with all these years is the only one that you can actually purchase from a commercial grower, a commercial uh, supplier. 
So the little lady beetle has been proven. We've released over 178,000 of these beetles throughout our Connecticut forest. And I can tell you, although there are skeptics out there, um, Judith, you can you can go throughout our state and see hemlocks. And I know a lot of it's due to the winters, but our hemlocks are still here. And Wonderful. I don't think that's a coincidence. Yep. No, I don't think so either. And, you know, bugs, just because you put them on one tree doesn't mean it's going to stay there. It's going to go somewhere, exactly. somewhere else. Yes, so, yes. Well, Carol, this is great information. Um, could you leave our listeners with your contact information? And uh, you, you, you mentioned that you have a new website starting up for monitoring the, this tree. Could you tell us about that, please? Yes, yes. My uh, please, uh, uh, everyone is is very welcome to contact me if you have more questions. Uh, so my email address is Carol Chia. So it's C A R O L E dot C H E A H at C T dot gov. So it's Carol Chia at C T dot gov, and um, I'm developing a Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Hemlock website actually which will be posted at our hopefully posted at our connecticut agricultural experiment station um, uh, website and will, i'm hoping to be able to give information such as such as the winter effects on on our, our delgic populations throughout the state and other little tidbits like the performance of the beetles that we've released for biocontrol links on where to get it etc um, just general information and actually i'm only one fault of a scientist who is following on a long history of uh, important research on hemlocks that's been done at the station way back from the 30s. So I'm going to try and post links to all that information. It's all tremendous information on growing hemlocks, hemlocks, uh, uh, variability, uh, all kinds of, of very useful information. I'm going to put it all there with links so that people don't have to search for it. They'll be able to click on it and get the original publication. Wonderful. That's uh, great resource information, especially for those of us here in the Northeast, including Nova Scotia, Canada, New York State, and Pennsylvania. Even probably uh, some of that's helpful to, to folks in the Appalachian region. Oh, definitely, <sighs> yes. They've actually started finding, um, I think they found um, a delegate there uh, up near Lake George, which is quite worrying. So that's a very cold part of the state in spite of the cold winters. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. In Nova Scotia, southern counties there discovered a big population of adelgids last August. So, yeah, it's it's happening. It's occurring. But there are things we can do, hopefully. And, and the more that listeners understand this problem and how it's it's a bigger problem than just the hemlock and the hemlock with the adelgid. Right. It is a um, bigger problem. I, I just thank you. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you again for joining us here at The Holistic Nature of Us. I know I'm very inspired by your talk and your very practical advice. I know I want to go outside and check my hemlocks a little more carefully. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Carol, again for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Judith. Thank you so much. So this is Judith Dreyer, the author of At the Garden's Gate book and blog. My book is available through my website as well as this podcast and the transcript of this podcast. Please go to www.judithdreyer.com, and I'd love you to share and uh, comment. All comments are appreciated. Let's get the word out. Today I want to end with a quote from Paul Hawken. He's an environmentalist and author who reminds us, Sustainability, ensuring the future life on Earth, is an infinite game the endless expression on behalf of all. Bye, everyone, and enjoy your day.